Multiple sclerosis is most typically diagnosed after someone has symptoms that are well known to be associated with the disease. For instance, someone could have numbness in the right face and arm and subsequently have an MRI scan that shows lesions typical of MS or have numbness from the waist down or have nagging pain in the right eye and pain with eye movements followed by blurry vision and then an examination would show findings typical of optic neuritis like a relative afferent pupillary defect, and then they could have an MRI that shows multiple sclerosis plaques and various other well-known syndromes. In older people, they may have progressive onset multiple sclerosis, which could be slower and more insidious, and people may not get diagnosed until they have a little bit more disability, for instance, progressive walking disability, and then maybe someone examines them and sees that their legs are in fact weak and they have myelopathic signs, in other words, signs of spinal cord injury, like brisk reflexes, and then they have MRI scans showing spinal cord lesions explaining their symptoms. However, it's well known that there's a lot of evidence that MS probably starts years prior to symptom onset in most people with the disease. And I made an entirely separate video on this topic, link in the description below if you wanna check it out. And one thing I mentioned is prodromal symptoms. In other words, sort of nonspecific, perhaps milder symptoms that could occur years before so-called symptom onset. But in this video, I'm going to argue that those are real and legitimate symptoms of MS, although they're recognized retrospectively. And I'm going to show the evidence for this phenomenon and explain the significance. So a lot of the symptoms I'm talking about are actually quite common in the general population. I'm talking about migraines, depression, anxiety, aches and pains throughout the body, cognitive fogging, fatigue, that kind of thing things that would not necessarily cause someone to suspect that they could have multiple sclerosis. Now, when I see someone who's newly diagnosed with MS, let's say they have double vision and they have an active lesion in the brainstem that explains their symptoms that's causing the eye movement disorder. Often they have numerous older plaques. I can't say how old they are. They don't take up gadolinium contrast dye, so they likely didn't develop in the last month, but we know that they're often years old. Well, how do we know that? Well, there are people with a phenomenon of so-called radiologically isolated syndrome. In other words, they have an MRI scan of the brain for another reason. Maybe they have headaches or head trauma, and they have lesions typical of MS, but they don't have any typical MS symptoms. And many of those people develop multiple sclerosis, but it could be many years later, in some cases over 10 years later. And so these lesions in the brain, what's happening? Well, just because there's a lesion doesn't mean there's necessarily that much damage. There could be a little demyelination and remyelination and the tissue functions well but also some areas of the brain are just less important. And in neurology, we refer to this as eloquence. An eloquent area is an area where if injured, it's likely to cause obvious symptoms like a speech area or a motor area. If someone can't speak or has weakness of the right side of the body, that's going to be very obvious both to the person and to their doctor. But some areas of the brain, like a small injury in the frontal lobe or the cerebellum may not cause overt symptoms. This is something that neurosurgeons are very interested in. If I take out the tumor and resect a little bit of the surrounding tissue, is it going to cause a terrible neurologic deficit? Or maybe is it in the cerebellum and I could be a little bit more aggressive to ensure there's a surgical cure of the tumor. Some areas of the brain are just less important, but not necessarily unimportant. So I'm going to make the argument that all those old plaques and maybe even changes in the normal appearing white matter that has been documented on autopsy studies and multimodal MRI could be contributing to these subtle symptoms. Here's a study from British Columbia, Canada, where they looked at 2,038 people with MS versus about 10,000 controls without MS. And they looked at nervous system complaints. These are complaints to healthcare professionals. And the line at one, the dotted horizontal line, is the 
of reference, in other words, the control group. And you can see, looking back, here is the time of diagnosis. This is minus one, one year before, minus three, three years before. You can see the rate of nervous system complaints is a little bit higher, roughly one to 1.5 times higher than the general population, even many years prior to diagnosis. Now, this could be a little bit of tingling that was a multiple sclerosis attack, but maybe it was too subtle to be recognized, or maybe even the physician just didn't realize that it was a clinical multiple sclerosis attack because the patient recovered spontaneously, for instance. Or it could be something that people thought of as being unrelated, such as a migraine headache. Let's look to musculoskeletal disorders, aches and pains, joint pain. Well, we know people with MS can have muscle spasms, but maybe there's something else. Maybe having subtle imbalance puts a little strain on your hip or other ligaments. And you can see it's just a slight difference, but it's a little bit above one most of the time. Maybe a 20% increased rate of skeletal system complaints many years prior to diagnosis. Even for mental health complaints, over 10 years prior to diagnosis, there's a significant spike around a 20 to 80% increase in mental health presentations. Now, there could be some biases here. Maybe some people are more likely to see doctors overall, and they're more likely to get diagnosed with mild or multiple sclerosis. And there could be some people out there, maybe they have depression, they just don't like to see doctors, and they also have undiagnosed MS. But I think the trend is too strong to be ignored. This is a real phenomenon. Here's a similar study in pediatric multiple sclerosis in Sweden. Now, people think of pediatric MS as being closer to the true pathophysiologic onset of the disease, which is probably true, but it may not be right at the true pathophysiologic onset. And this is a log scale, so it's a little misleading, a 1 to 10 scale. But these are various health type complaints, which tend to be elevated up to 10 years prior to diagnosis. Infections, are up. Why is that? Well, maybe there's slight spinal cord injury, bladder doesn't work as well, higher rate of urinary tract infections, more injuries, more depression and anxiety, or maybe people just feel subjectively lousier, so they're more likely to see doctors for something else that is unrelated to MS. This study looks at absenteeism, missed work days, and the right side is the time of symptom onset of multiple sclerosis, and the horizontal dotted line is the general population missed work rate. And if you look several years, about six years prior to diagnosis, there seems to be a trend towards a little bit more missed work days. If you go way back, people with MS are doing great, maybe even missing less work days than their counterparts. And granted, a lot of these years are not statistically significant, but the trend is clear with several years, people who subsequently have symptoms of MS having more missed work days prior to their reported symptom onset, suggesting they had some kind of subtle illness. Fertility declines around the time of diagnosis of MS. So the vertical line is symptom onset. Not diagnosis, but symptom onset. The men are depicted in blue, the women are depicted in red, and years prior to symptom onset, fertility rates for people who subsequently get MS are roughly the same as the general population. And after diagnosis, it's a little bit less, which makes sense if you're dealing with a new serious diagnosis, you may be less likely to want to get pregnant. But even prior to reported symptom onset, there's a huge drop for both men and women. In fact, in the two years prior to onset, for women, only 4.5% are giving birth versus 8.4% in the general population. This is statistically significant and quite a major change for someone who isn't reporting any complaints. Migraines are more common in people with MS. Now, you may say that could be a secondary factor. That could be more stress related to the diagnosis or sleep deprivation. People are waking up a lot to go to the bathroom or have muscle cramps or other problems problems that disturb their sleep. But no, prior to symptom onset, people who subsequently get MS have more migraines. For instance, in this study, people without MS, this is just women without MS, 11% had migraines. But in the five years prior to symptom onset, 
18% of people who subsequently got symptoms of MS had migraines. Why is there a difference? Your guess is as good as mine. And this is particularly interesting because the pathology of migraine is thought to be very different from MS. It's thought to come from the blood vessels of the brain that they could be dilated during a migraine attack. And in the endothelium of the blood vessels, there could be activation of this neurotransmitter, calcitonin gene related peptide. So it's very, very different from inflammation and demyelination, but there's definitely an association. Gastrointestinal symptoms are more common in people who subsequently have symptom onset of MS. In this study, the vertical line is the rate of this disorder in the general population, and you can see all of them are to the right in people with MS, meaning they're more prevalent. And some of them make sense, constipation. We know spinal cord injury causes constipation. That's a legitimate known symptom of MS. Irritable bowel syndrome. People could have abdominal banding that's actually due to MS and is misdiagnosed as irritable bowel syndrome, perhaps. But a lot of these things, ulcers, diseases of the liver, diseases of the pancreas, these shouldn't be related to MS. Why are they more prevalent? It could be something weird. Maybe people with MS, they have these other complaints. They tend to be more likely to have endoscopies and colonoscopies, maybe get diagnosed with things that aren't actually the cause of their symptoms. I don't know, but there's definitely an association. It seems to be part of this MS prodrome. Psychiatric disease is also more common and people subsequently diagnosed with MS prior to symptom onset. This is another excellent study from British Columbia, Canada. You can see cases, people who got MS on top, and again, this is T minus one, two, three, four, five years, so diagnosis is over here, or symptom onset is over here, and clearly there are more psychiatric diseases, and this is mostly things like common disorders like anxiety and depression, less commonly things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. It is possible to have bipolar disorder that is induced with bimultiple sclerosis and other neurological injuries. Classically, if someone has large lesions in the right frontal lobe, they can have symptoms of mania and other symptoms that could mimic bipolar disorder. If you look at psychotropic prescriptions, they're also way up in people with MS compared to the general population, the dotted line. We're talking around 70% increase, suggesting something was going on to cause these people to seek these prescriptions. And this is a summary of many of the prodromal symptoms that have been commonly reported in people who later get diagnosed with MS. Specifically, migraine headaches, those pounding, throbbing, severe headaches, often with sensitivity to light and sound and associated nausea, where people prefer to lie down and rest during the migraine attack. Interestingly, other forms of headache like tension headaches don't seem to be more common in people who subsequently get MS. Fatigue. Now, of course, many people have fatigue, and there isn't necessarily a specific description of fatigue that would be associated with MS. Classically, people with sleep apnea, even after a full night's rest, they don't feel good even in the morning. Whereas people with MS, they may feel good upon awakening if they slept well, but later on they crash and feel completely exhausted. That's a classic description of MS fatigue, but everyone experiences it a little bit differently. Sleep Sleep changes, insomnia or excessive sleep, mood changes, anxiety, depression, even irritability, pain, various pain syndromes, more to be discussed on the next slide, bowel bladder problems, constipation, urinary hesitancy, feeling like you can't completely empty your bladder or you have to go frequently, cognitive symptoms, brain fog, poor multitasking ability, not necessarily something like decrease in short-term memory or decrease in intelligence. Many of these people are still working, still being productive, but they can tell there's a difference compared to their old baseline. Numbness. Now, many symptoms of numbness are classic for MS, like in a large area of the body, like one half of the body or from the neck down or the waist down, but I'm talking about vague or patchy numbness that wouldn't necessarily be recognized as a distinct clinical cerebral or spinal cord syndrome or a vague imbalance that maybe isn't that profound. Now, pain is a very common symptom in the MS prodrome, and there are certain
certain pain syndromes that are well known to be associated with MS, such as trigeminal neuralgia or electric shock-like facial pain. And people with that condition are generally recommended to have an MRI scan of the brain anyway, because it can be associated with central nervous system diseases such as MS, though more commonly it's due to a blood vessel irritating the nerve, which is difficult to see on MRI. Things like neuropathic pain, burning of the leg and arm, hypersensitivity, allodynia, a normally non-noxious stimulus causes pain, the aforementioned abdominal banding. These are known to be associated with MS. However, in the United Kingdom, there was a study and they found that people who subsequently were diagnosed with MS five years prior, they had over double the rate of pain complaints. The odds ratio was 2.21 compared to the general population. But a lot of these pain complaints weren't these classic pain syndromes that are known to be linked to MS. They were things that were common in the general population, abdominal pain, low back pain, joint pain, muscle aches. They were very nonspecific, but significant. So the point I'm trying to make in this video when I say symptom onset in quotes is that when someone has optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, that probably wasn't really their symptom onset. That was just the symptom that was clear enough to lead to a diagnosis, but all those vague complaints for many years, they were real and legitimate symptoms of MS. Now, of course, it's impossible to determine with 100% accuracy that someone's fatigue five years prior to optic neuritis was due to MS and not something else like sleep deprivation or hypothyroidism or B12 deficiency, but on a population level, it definitely is a legitimate symptom of MS. And this is something that's obvious from clinical practice. Many, many of my patients have told me I felt lousy and fatigued for years. I had these weird aches and pains. I wasn't as athletic as I normally would. I was imbalanced. I felt like my bladder wasn't working properly. This is something I've heard over and over again. And I think we have to recognize that these are symptoms of MS, even though they could be a little bit ambiguous at times. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should do an MRI of the brain on everyone with fatigue or everyone with migraine. This is not a practical approach to practice medicine, and it's going to lead to a massive increase in cost of healthcare and a lot of wrong diagnoses of MS. And that's another big problem. Some people who have nonspecific symptoms and maybe nonspecific white matter findings on MRI get misdiagnosed with MS, and I see that quite a bit too, so you have to be very careful. But I think it's important to recognize these symptoms because they can be significant and they can often be treatable. And sometimes they could support a diagnosis of MS, though of course we can't rely entirely on some of these symptoms. And I'd be interested to know if you could share your own experience. Do you think many years prior to symptom onset, you had this vague prodromal phase where something was wrong. You had gastrointestinal symptoms, pain, psychiatric changes, migraines. Let me know in the comments below and suggest other videos about MS.